On behalf of Joe Lucia, the staff of Falvey Memorial Library, I'd like to welcome you to the first uh, event in our 2012 presidential election uh, lecture series. Uh, today we're going to feature uh, Matt Kerbel and David Barrett of the Political Science Department. And I'll say briefly that uh, our next follow-up event will be on Tuesday, November 27th in this same spot here, Speaker's Corner, and we'll feature Theodore Rappas and uh, Jack Johannes as speakers. Uh, today uh, we have Matt Kerbel. Uh, the current chair of political science. He's been a professor in the department since 1988. He's written extensively on the relationship between politics and media, especially television, and now more recently the internet. He's the author of If It Bleeds, It Leads, An Anatomy of TV News, and Net Roots, Online Progressives, and the Transformation of American Politics. Also, we have David Barrett, who's been a professor here since 1990. Uh, his research interests include foreign policy, the presidency, and other American national political institutions, and uh, Congressional Oversight of Intelligence Agencies. He's the author of The CIA and Congress, The Untold Story from Truman to Kennedy, and Uncertain Warriors, Lyndon Johnson and His Vietnam Advisors. Today we're gonna have uh, two 20-minute uh, lectures back to back, followed by a 20-minute period of uh, question and answer. Uh, first, Matt Kerbel will present on understanding the 2012 election, what's likely to happen in two weeks, followed directly by David Barrett uh, with some lessons from political science about presidential elections. And to get us started, may I introduce to you Matt Kerbel. Thanks very much. Have I really been here since 1988? That's, uh, that's what it says on your I guess, I guess it's true then. Um, there's not much court here, so I'll just uh, stand next to the podium. And I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming today. There's a lot to fit into 20 minutes, so let me, let me try to offer everybody a way of looking at the structure of this election. On the one hand, oh, do we have court? Not too much. Oh, there we go. On the one hand, we have economics, and on the other hand, we have demographics. And I think the best way to think about what's going on this year is to think about these two groups of forces in tension with one another. On the economic side, we're all very aware of the economy. We're aware that we've been through four very long and difficult years. We know that unemployment is still very high. We know that a lot of people individually believe that their situation is either bad or not likely to get better in the next year. When we ask people about the direction of the country, large majorities say the country is going in the wrong direction, and a lot of that is because of the economic issues affecting their daily lives. When you look at those numbers together, you have a situation that makes it very difficult for an incumbent president running for re-election. And it's, I think it's impossible to think about what's going on this year without looking at those numbers and without looking at the economic picture. But on the other hand, on the other side, you also have demographics. We have a changing electorate. We have an electorate that looks different than it did in 2008, very different than it did in 2000, and dramatically different than it did in the 20th century. It's a more multicultural electorate. It's a younger electorate. And this is the Obama electorate. If you look at the coalition that elected Barack Obama in 2008, it's a coalition of millennials, like many of you guys in this room, a coalition of uh, people of color, Latinos, the largest growing electoral group in the United States, as well as single women. That's the Obama coalition. The thing to keep in mind about this coalition is that in terms of raw numbers, this is an ascending group. It's getting larger. In terms of participation, however, these are unlikely voters. Sometimes if you listen to political reports, they'll talk about the difference between registered voters and likely voters. Likely voters are people who are pretty likely to go to the polls in two weeks and vote in the election. Unlikely voters are, are not. Obama won the presidency in 2008 by putting together a coalition of unlikely voters and getting them to the polls. Obama, really from an electoral standpoint, is the president of the emerging America. The Republican challenger, Mitt Romney, has a coalition that is older, wider, and shrinking. But it's also more likely to participate. And this year, it's animated 
to get Barack Obama out of the White House. So these are the two forces that are at odds with each other that are shaping what has turned out to be a very close election. Now, for the better part of this year, I've characterized this election as close but not competitive. And I think that was the case up until a couple of weeks ago. It was close in all the polling, but it was not competitive in the sense that through the spring and into the summer, Mitt Romney was consistently polling a couple of points behind Barack Obama. So he would consistently show up a couple of points back. Now a couple of points doesn't sound like very much, but it was a stubborn disadvantage. It was a fairly consistent disadvantage. And over the course of the year, we've seen that disadvantage range from about two to three points to at its, at its peak about maybe five or six points right before the first debate when everything changed. So let's talk a little bit about what led up to that first debate, how everything changed, and what that means for what's likely to happen in the next couple of weeks. The Romney campaign, as I see it, has actually had three iterations. Let's, let's take the first one. Let's call it Romney 1.0, right? the first Romney campaign. The strategy, the initial strategy of the Romney campaign was to play on the economic advantages that the challenger has in a difficult economy. And the thinking was that people are unhappy. If you look at some of those figures that I mentioned a little bit you know, at the beginning, people are unhappy. They're unhappy with their personal situation. They're unhappy with the direction of the economy. They want to make a change. If Romney present, presents himself as that alternative, he's the change. People will vote for him essentially by default because enough people will want to go in a different direction. And it is the case that even today, people want the country to go in a different direction. Even a large share of people who say they're going to vote for Obama want the country to go in a different direction. They want his second term to be different from his first term. So Romney, Romney believed, and, and I, I think it was a legitimate belief, I think it was a pretty good strategy. He believed that all he needed to do was win the nomination, show up, attack the incumbent, don't be too specific, and you will win because you're the other choice. And there was another reason why he didn't want to be too specific. He came out of a bruising primary campaign where it was very clear that the Republican Party is animated by a fairly conservative vision that doesn't play very well with the middle of the electorate. So remember, Mitt Romney was a fairly moderate governor of a democratic state. So he doesn't, really, he doesn't really come out of that part of the Republican coalition uh, that is naturally a true believing conservative. In fact, there's a great deal of mistrust between the Republican base and Mitt Romney. It perpetuates, continues through today. They don't quite trust him. Uh, they're skeptical of whether he would genuinely be conservative. So Romney always needed to look over his shoulder and make sure that his conservative base was behind him. Running a campaign where you're presenting yourself as the alternative to an unpopular incumbent in a difficult year allowed him the flexibility to not get too specific. And in fact, one of the characteristics of the Romney campaign over the course of the summer was that he did not move to the center the way candidates usually do after they get their nomination. He actually continued to look over his shoulder at his right flank. The selection of Paul Ryan as a running mate was a nod to the Republican base. It said, now do you believe me? Now do you believe that I'm credible, that I'll govern as a conservative? Because even into July and early August, there were doubts about whether Romney would that came from the base that Romney needed to satisfy and he needed to address. Around midsummer, it became apparent to the Romney campaign that the strategy of simply being the alternative was not going to be enough because this stubborn two, three-point edge continued to persist on, on, in Obama's favor. It wasn't simply going to be enough to be the alternative. And the reason why is interesting. Obama's approval numbers on the economy are in the low 40s. And the economy is clearly the number one issue among voters. Usually you put those two things together 
and you say the incumbent is not viable. Yet Obama's overall job <laughs> approval numbers hover close to 50%, 48, 49, 50, right in the range of viability. That's about where George W. Bush was in 2004 when he was reelected in, in a close election. Why the difference? Because a large chunk of the public still blames Bush for the economy. In other words, even though people are unhappy by and large with Obama's economic performance, they don't all blame him for it. And some actually believe that he's done a pretty good job or he's done what he could under very difficult circumstances. The Romney campaign recognized by midsummer that they could not win the election simply by being the alternative to Obama because there was enough goodwill in the electorate to put Obama over the top even in difficult economic times. So Romney had to reboot his campaign. And that's when we saw Romney 2.0, which was the Romney who decided to try to win the election on the demographic side rather than on the economic side. This is when Mitt Romney started talking about how President Obama had said, you didn't build that, talking about how uh, President Obama uh, didn't fully understand the market economy or wasn't supportive of the market economy. Uh, now, in order to make that case, he did have to take Obama's words out of context. This is also when the Romney campaign was pushing hard on a message about welfare reform and, and how, and how uh, Obama was uh, trying to undermine the welfare to work provisions of the welfare law. All of these messages designed to get his base animated, to get his base going. These are all messages designed to win a demographic race by simply getting more of your people to the polls. But in order to do that, he, he basically had to create a straw man version of the president. He sort of had to run against a Barack Obama who wasn't really there. Uh, this, is, this is the Barack Obama, I mean, metaphorically, uh, if you remember Clint Eastwood yelling at the empty chair that supposedly Obama was sitting in at the Republican convention, that, that metaphorically was what Romney 2.0 was all about, to try to win the race in a challenging demographic climate by getting your voters out to the polls. During this period of time, Romney actually fell further behind in the polling. It wasn't working. Now, if the natural structure of this race is a two-point or a three-point Obama advantage, Obama stretched that advantage out to about four or five points in August and into September. The difference is the campaigning. Obama was having an effective stretch of weeks taking his message to the public while Romney was struggling trying to win a demographic contest that really wasn't working in his favor to begin with. So he needed to reboot a third time. Now it's kind of funny because over the summer uh, when I would talk to groups like this, I would say that the irony is that if you look at Mitt Romney when he was governor of Massachusetts, or if you look at Mitt Romney when he started running for president, there is a version of Mitt Romney that could be competitive in this economic climate, even with the demographic disadvantage that Republicans face. And that Mitt Romney is the Mitt Romney who first ran for president, who would have been able to say, I am a moderate governor of a democratic state who can work on a bipartisan basis, who is able to reach across the aisle and work with democratic legislators to be able to advance a liberal priority, health care reform, universal coverage, but use conservative market-based principles to get it done. And I, I would, I would, when I would talk to groups over the summer, I would say, that's a very compelling argument. That is a powerful argument. And that's the argument that Mitt Romney could potentially win with if his base would allow him to run as a moderate. But they won't. And they didn't until the first debate. Because on the eve of the first debate, Romney was on the verge of disqualification. So he came to the first debate and he rebooted his campaign. We now have Romney 3.0. He reinvented himself as the moderate he once was and presented himself as a moderate candidate to a public that by and large wasn't really tuned in quite yet. We know that people really start to focus on the election in the fall. 
Now, maybe some of you are, you know, I mean, you're, you're spending a part of your afternoon here listening to a, a discussion of, of the election, so I have to assume that you guys have above average interest. But most people don't, and we're busy, we do other things. For many people who had only been paying casual attention to the election early on, they were listening to Obama's commercials. They may have heard a little bit of the news narrative here and there. And what they were hearing was that this, this Mitt Romney character is, is sort of too extreme, out of touch, uh, can't relate to people. Uh, and of course, people aren't going to, to like that, right? But then they turned on the first debate. And here's somebody who, uh, who is compelling, who's moderate, who's accessible, uh, who sounds reasonable. Now, in order to do it, he has to disown some of the key positions uh, of his own campaign. But, you know, if you're not paying attention, you don't really know that. And what you see is really very compelling. So, moderate Mitt Romney shows up at the first debate. Barack Obama doesn't show up at the first debate. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is one of the big mysteries, and please, I know someone's going to raise their hand and say, where was Obama in the first debate? I, I don't have an answer. I don't really have an answer for that. Uh, he really did appear to have checked out. Uh, the, the best answer I can give is that he was playing prevent defense. He was playing not to lose because he had a lead in the polls. That's possible. Uh, but whatever the reason, it was clearly a strategic mistake because by not challenging Mitt Romney 3.0, Romney got to establish Mitt Romney 3.0 as the default Romney candidate going into the final stretch in the campaign. And once that happened, a contest that previously had been close but not competitive became competitive, with national polls tightening to what appears to be very close to a tie. If you track the average polling, and you want to be careful not to look too much at any one survey, and there's a lot of polling data out there, but if you track the averages in the polling over time, what we see is that in the, in the days immediately following the first debate, there was a shift towards Romney of several points, maybe four or five points, effectively erasing whatever advantage Obama had up until then. In the last week to 10 days, that has eased a little bit and the polling has moved back gradually in Obama's favor to the point where he appears to be on balance up by about one nationally and maybe a little bit more than that in a couple of key swing states. Uh, but again, the, these, these numbers are, uh, are, are, are they're, they're very close. And what I think we may have been seeing over the past week is uh, regression to the mean. If, if the tendency in this race is Obama by a narrow margin, by a couple of points, we may be seeing the polls correct to that state again. Uh, we also don't know how last night's debate is going to play out. Traditionally, the impression you get first in the first debate matters more than the impression that you get in subsequent debates. In particular, I think that's the case when people are uh, just deciding whether or not Romney uh, is an acceptable alternative. And I think he cleared that threshold in the first debate. Once that happens, trying to change that is like unringing a bell. You can't do it. So I don't think that Obama realistically could have accomplished that, uh, although early opinion polls suggest that Obama did present better yesterday than Romney did. Whether or not the polls continue to revert to a two-point margin or something in that range remains to be seen, and we really won't know that until the weekend. But if they do, it's as much reverting back to the central tendency of this contest than anything else. And at that central tendency, where, we're, where we end up is uh, a close race, now a competitive race, a race where there is a small but persistent advantage for Obama in the Electoral College, where he's leading persistently but by small amounts in enough states to win the Electoral College. But it is very close. It's a little bit too close to bet on it. So if Mitt Romney comes in and asks you to bet $10,000 on it, I wouldn't take that bet. Uh, it's a reference to something he said to Rick Perry in one of the uh, primary debates where he said, I'll bet you $10,000 on that. I wouldn't take that bet. I think it's going to be very close. But I do think in the end, because of the structure of the race, it's going to come down to turnout. And let me get back very briefly to the difference between registered voters and likely voters, which is where I started. In a race where the demographics are up against the economics, the way Obama wins 
is by motivating that a, 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 a sizable enough percentage of the new electorate that voted for him four years ago. Now he's got to do it without hope and he's got to do it without change. That's harder. It's always harder and when you're an incumbent you've got a record, you have a record, people are angry at you, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. That's a harder thing to do. But they have a very good field operation and they know where their voters are. It's all a question of whether those voters come out in large enough numbers to be able to counter what we already know to be a very significant Republican vote, where Republican voters are motivated to come out and vote, if not for Romney, then against Obama. In order for Romney to win, one of two things has to happen. Either the small pool of undecided voters, and we're, at this point we're looking at just a couple of percent, have to break significantly in Romney's direction, just enough to break the tie and put him over the edge. Does that happen? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. In 2004, the undecided voters broke evenly between the two candidates and it didn't make a difference. So we don't know. That has to happen for Romney or Romney's voters have to come out in large enough numbers because they're motivated that they're able to keep the changing demographics at bay one more time. That's the way Romney wins. And so for Obama to win, again, it's the opposite. Obama probably can't win over too many of those undecided voters at this point. If he hasn't done it by now, he, he probably can't do it. That's, that's going to happen or it's not. But I don't know that there's anything he can do to make that happen at this point. What he needs to do is focus on the ground game, focus on the field work, get his voters out in key states. The states to watch are Ohio, as well as Ohio, and I'd recommend looking at Ohio, and uh, Ohio. And if you look at those four, oh, because, because it's been said that no Republican has won the White House without Ohio, uh, that's not likely to change this year. When you look at the states that are pretty clearly going to go Obama's way and the states that are clearly going to go Romney's way, there are a few toss-up states in the middle. Ohio is the most important. I'd also look at Iowa. I'd look at Wisconsin, Nevada, Colorado, Florida, Virginia, and to a lesser extent, North Carolina. That's where this election is playing out. Everywhere else in the country, the election's already over. So this election is playing out in that handful of states. That's where you'll see the candidates campaign. And over the next two weeks, we're going to know which way this is going to break. And on that note, I will turn this over to Dr. Barrett, and I thank you all very much. Thank you, Matt, and it's good to be with everyone here, and it's, it's nice to see a good turnout. There are a lot of people here who are not in my 230 presidency class, so I define that as a good turnout when you don't have to be here, and, you, and yet you are. Um, Matt won't recall this, but I do, that when I joined the Villanova faculty, I was hired especially to teach national security policy, but I also had a real interest in the presidency, and he had been teaching presidency courses, and so, you know, you're a new faculty member, you don't want to rock the boat or anything, but I sort of cautiously went to Matt and I said, would you mind if I teach presidency occasionally? And he said, not at all. So he and I have, uh, have been uh, presidency scholars and, and, and warm colleagues for a lot of years now in the uh, department. Okay, so I think the title that I suggested for my part of the talk would be something about what can we learn from, uh, what does political science have to say about presidential elections? Uh, sometimes not as much as you might want. There's a journal called PS uh, Political Science and Politics, sorry for the small cover there, that's as big as I could find online. They did an interesting thing, uh, and this is a journal that reaches most of the political scientists in the United States. They invited, the editors invited, 13 political scientists who specialize in some way in presidential campaigns and elections to use their preferred models and theories to predict, and they, they had to make these predictions some, uh, a few months ago, to predict who would win the election. Uh, most focused on who would win the national popular vote. As you know, it gets a bit tricky with the Electoral College sometimes. Uh, usually the, the candidate who wins the national popular vote wins the Electoral College as well, so I won't go into more than that for now. Anyway, so of these 13 political scientists using their preferred models and, and theories to predict who would win. 
eight of them came up with predictions and articles, and this is the current, this is the October issue of PS, Politics and Political Science. Eight of them predicted an Obama victory. However, in two or three of those cases, the margin was so incredibly narrow that, that those two or three political scientists with their models, their predictions, basically said, it's a toss-up. So five pretty strongly predicting Obama will win, will win, two or three saying Obama probably will win the national popular vote, but it's just such a close margin. Um, five of them predicted that Governor Romney will win the race. So if you're looking for clarity from political science, good luck. They're split. Who's going to win? It's, it's sort of a toss-up if you turn to political scientists. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about, uh, just, just I picked three and just giving you the titles and say a little something about their, their models and theories. One of the 13 uh, scholars uses what's called the, the leading economic indicators model, things like job growth and, and, and such things. And, and this was one who predicted a very narrow Obama victory. Another focuses uh, almost exclusively on jobs, job growth, unemployment rate, and that scholar uh, says that President, this is a, a quote, President Obama appears destined to lose his job. There's a model called the bread and peace model where that scholar, that political scientist, looks at the economy but also looks at the question of whether or not Americans are dying abroad in some battlefields. And on that basis, uh, and as you know, some Americans are dying uh, in Afghanistan these days. Uh, that, that model predicted a big Obama loss. But again, the, the sort of the bottom line, if you want to ask what can political scientists say about the likeliest outcome, it's very much a split sort of a uh, prediction. The models that these scholars use are rather intricate. So I thought, well, let's turn to a more basic uh, insight from political science. A pretty good uh, predictor for how much a president will get when he c comes up for re-election is, well, what, what's the approval rating for that incumbent president? Now, I know in the back you won't be able to read these numbers, but, and I'm using here the Real Clear Politics uh, website, which, which is excellent in some ways, excellent for bringing together polling and that sort of thing. I'm not so thrilled with most of the commentary that can be found on real clear politics because frankly so much of it it's so polarized it's angry it's shallow so I don't go to real clear politics for a lot of what I consider substantive commentary but I like how they bring together a lot of the polling data and what it says is that the uh, sort of the the summary approval rating for President Obama 49.3 percent just on the basis of this, you would say, well, here, even if you didn't know the name of the president, didn't know the year, if you just looked at that number, you'd say, well, this president, whoever it is, whatever year it is, this president is in a position of, of possibly winning re-election or possibly not. Um, now, these are, this is recent polling, but if we go back, and by the way, here is the black line is approval the red line is disapproval, and this is going back over, um, well, it doesn't say how far back, but it goes back a long ways. Uh, if we look at all the data, one thing I'll just point out, if we go back to previous years, go back um, earlier in time, the president's appro uh, approval numbers have, have frankly usually been in the 40s, the mid 40s, the upper 50, the upper 40s, rarely rarely do they get into the 50% uh, or above. So it's, it's, it's worrisome for the uh, Obama campaign. These numbers are, I think Matt referred to this, these numbers are not unlike the numbers for George W. Bush in 2004. He tended to have these approval ratings in, in that last year or so. They went up a bit as Obama's have, as, they've got, as we've gotten closer to the election. So President Bush as well faced uh, some uh, worrisome numbers, but also numbers that said, well, yeah, you might be able to win re-election, and in fact, uh, he did. One other thing to take into account, uh, so Obama's approval ratings of his job performance tends to hover around 
it's right now it's about 49 and the average for recent months or so 49 and a half percent but another question that pollsters ask is and, and the wording varies but basically do you approve of this do you, of, of Obama or whoever the incumbent president is as a person you know do you like this person do you approve of this person and Obama always gets some version, in virtually every poll, some version of a solid majority approval. So in other words, there are some people who, who think well of Obama personally, but who do not think that he has <coughs> succeeded as president. So there's a difference between the job approval ratings and the personal approval ratings. Uh, ac across much of the year, Obama has done much better than Romney in terms of personal approval ratings, but in recent weeks or so, uh, Governor Romney has, uh, has narrowed that. And I think this personal approval thing matters somewhat. Um, let's talk about the national polling. I checked the other day, I guess it was yesterday, I looked, how many, I, I like to see how many polls are there, let me just scroll down a bit. You, you'll just see from the headlines, which I think you can see, headlines about different polls. So this poll, Obama closes gap, the race is tied. This poll, Romney has a four-point national lead. Romney leads by two. Uh, Obama leads Romney by two. Obama by one point nationally. So I checked yesterday how many polls had been made available, national polls, uh, where the polling went up through the, the day before that. And I think it was something like nine different polls. A couple of them were outliers. That is, the uh, Gallup poll was showing uh, Romney ahead nationwide by about uh, 6% or so. But there was another poll that had Obama with about a five-point lead, and, and others were, were, were closer. So uh, I think it's, you know, it's fair to say this race is, is close, maybe very close. Uh, unless one of those outliers is correct. Honestly, the, the, the two outlier polls, the one showing Romney with a big lead, the one showing with Obama with a big lead nationally, I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Um, this is a graphic... Let's go down a little bit. A graphic illustration of the last year or so, yes, 2012. And this sort of reflects what Matt has referred to of Obama having some kind of a lead over Romney, but <laughs> you also see this, October, uh, a, narrowing of the a narrowing of the race um, uh, in a number of polls showing Romney with some version of a lead. So I think it has uh, tightened in recent weeks. But I have talked here a lot about the national popular vote. Let's, again, let's get back to some basics. One of the things in, a, in an intro uh, to American government course or a sort of intro U.S. presidency course, the national popular vote, really, it, it doesn't matter. Just ask Al Gore. In the year 2000, Al Gore won the national popular vote by about half a million. It didn't, ma it didn't matter. What matters is what happens in the Electoral College. So, Electoral College. I am one of those people I'm not sure if this is true of Matt or not, but he can tell us in the Q&A session. I'm one of those people who is obsessing about this campaign, obsessing about this race, and I go to the Real Clear Politics Interactive Electoral College map at least once a day, sometimes twice a day, sometimes three times a day, and play out different scenarios based on some recent polling. I commit a, a sin that no social scientist should commit, and Matt has warned us against it, which is, you know, when you see some one poll, you know, and <laughs> I have a tendency sometimes to go, oh my God, and, and what, what, you know, if, if, if suddenly Ohio, you know, something has changed there, or Florida, and you know, what are the ramifications? Well, really, we should stay calm. I should stay calm. Uh, but, I, but the fact is, I do obsess about this, and I go to 
um, to this. Now, I'm going to go to the Let's see, create your own map. So this is the interactive electoral college map on real career politics. And I always go to the no, you see right now you see states in gray where according to their formula, the race is somewhat close. Uh, and I don't really buy all of this. For example, Pennsylvania, yes I know that Romney has narrowed the margins and the polling in Pennsylvania, but I haven't seen a poll showing Romney ahead, and, and honestly, I just don't think Romney is going to win Pennsylvania. Um, so anyway, what I do is I choose the no toss-ups option, which basically it shows, okay, it may be close, but in every state, who's ahead right now, even if it's only by half a percent when you take an average of the fairly recent polling that is done. So blue obviously representing states uh, that as of now, at least supposedly, are, are in inclined to go Democratic and the red states Republican. Uh, do I have any disagreements with this? Um, I think it's pretty clear from the polls, New Hampshire could go to Governor Romney. It could happen. I don't think it will. It could happen. Virginia, uh, the indication here, it, recent polling in Virginia has been good for Governor Romney. Virginia could go for Romney, and I'm not, I'm not going to say that it won't. I guess I'll say, well, look, Colorado, uh, Matt mentioned Colorado. Colorado certainly could go for Obama rather than Romney. I think most of these are accurate. And I just want to point out, I think, that really, and Matt said this as well, Ohio is a tremendously important state for Governor Romney. I have a very hard time mapping out a victory for Romney if he does not win the state of Ohio. Under this scenario, these states going these ways, you see uh, Obama with 281, Romney with 257 electoral college votes. It takes 270 to win the electoral college. Um, you know, which of these states is, uh, can, can, can Romney peel off? If, if, if Obama wins Ohio, how can Romney win? Well, we can give, um, I'm trying to give it to Romney. Okay. Um, well, New Hampshire. Romney might win there, but that's not going to do it. 261 electoral college votes. Um, I think if Romney, if Romney wins Ohio, which I don't think he's going to do, but if It just becomes very doable. I really think this, if, if Romney does not win Ohio, he's not going to win the presidency. If Romney wins Ohio, I think he will probably win the presidency. Mind you, I still think there's a map, and I won't go through that. There, there are scenarios of Obama winning the presidency while not winning Ohio. It, it's hard for Obama to do that, but with Romney, I really think that it's just about impossible. So I was on uh, one of the local television stations this morning, and after we talked about the debates, the interviewer said, so what do you think, it's, what do you think they're going to be doing, the candidates, the next couple of weeks? And I said, I think they're both moving to Ohio. <laughs> and I just stopped, and, and the interviewer and I were not in the same studio. You know, you're, you're looking at each other through monitors and microphones and all this stuff. So, and, and so I was trying to be witty. You all gave me a decent laugh. When I said this to him, he just got this panicked look on his face like, why has he stopped talking? But it's like, you know, they're, they're going to be in Ohio a lot. Um, okay, point number four, national security policy, foreign policy. In most presidential elections, that issue area doesn't matter 
very much. I think it's good that we had a debate that was uh, focused more or less on uh, foreign policy last night, but it doesn't matter very much. I mean, this is a real problem for John McCain in 2008. I mean, here's McCain with these excellent national security foreign policy credentials, but we were having this economic crisis. So the national security stuff, I teach national security policy. I think it should matter, but the fact is that it doesn't. And then finally, this takes us to the debate of last night. Historically, when most people look at the history of televised presidential debates, uh, most analysts would agree that most of those debates do not end up making some identifiable difference in the, in the outcome in early November. Now, arguably, the very first one, televised 1960, Nixon versus Kennedy, did make a difference for John F. Kennedy. Um, maybe in 2000, maybe in 2000 when it was uh, Gore versus Bush and there was the one night where Gore had really what looked like orange makeup. And I don't know if it was the same debate, there was a debate where Gore was sort of very physically in Bush's space and, then, and, and there was a debate where Gore was sighing a lot. So like I think Al Gore probably hurt himself in, in, in those debates, but usually they don't matter a lot. But uh, I think that the, the first debate this year did matter. I know Matt thinks so as well. I think, and, and we saw it in that graphic representation where somewhere along the way in October, suddenly there was polling showing uh, Romney, some polling showing Romney ahead. So I think that this debate mattered. Uh, since Matt talked about was, you know, this whole matter of what happened with uh, President Obama in the first debate, honestly, and I was watching it with graduate students in a, in a course that I'm teaching. I was stunned by President, first of all, I, I'll say, I was impressed that Governor Romney was energetic, he looked good, he was assertive, he was generally articulate, he was, he was there. President Obama had this sort of low energy, he looked tired, he looked down a lot, he, um, I'm not sure what the story is. Al Gore had a theory that it was the high altitude. Uh, one of my students said, you know, it was, as Obama said at the event, it was, it was his anniversary. Maybe that put him off for, for some reason. I don't really agree with those two theories, but they're out there. You know, a lot of what I read suggests that, personally, Obama has contempt for Romney. And, frankly, going into these debates, uh, Obama was not excited about doing them. Uh, had, I don't want to say contempt, but wasn't thrilled about the very concept of having to do these debates. And I think maybe he thought, well, he'll just, he can sort of show up, He'd, he had done his homework, and he can just sort of speak to the questions, and you know, but not be 100% there. If so, that was an, an arrogant uh, mistake on his part. Um, the, let's see, Florida. The polling, I wanted to mention, just show one of these, and then I will, Florida. If, if one goes back further in time, you can see, I'll just scroll down, you can see a lot of blue over to the far right. Those are polls where Obama used to be ahead, but most of the polling in more recent times, you know, there's this one poll recently with Obama with a one-point margin in Florida, but mostly it's Romney. I think partly that's because of the uh, uh, debate. Uh, last night, I thought that President Obama did quite well. I think Romney did a, a sort of credible uh, presentation in the debate. I suspect that debate last night will help Obama, but but just about this much, not a whole lot. I want. I know we want to save time for questions and answers. So on that note, uh, thank you for having me. And Matt, you want to come up and we'll take questions. So, uh, questions, yes? Yeah. What is the significance of early voting? This is the first election that I've heard a lot about. It. And is it as significant as it probably is, or is it not? Uh, it is very significant. And if I could just watch the cords, just watch the cords yeah. Uh, it is significant uh, in that, uh, especially if you go back to what we were talking about earlier regarding likely and unlikely voters. To the degree that Obama's voters are less likely to turn out on their own than Romney's voters, what early voting allows 
uh, and both campaigns try to do this, but I think it's more critical for Obama. What early voting allows him to do is find those voters uh, uh, that the campaign knows will vote for him and get them to the polls and essentially bank those votes. And what that does, it does two things. It puts votes basically in the bank for election day. So that going into election day, especially in a year like this where you can pretty much tell how someone's going to vote based on whether they register as a Democrat or a Republican, they can go into election day with a pretty good sense of where they are, uh, what percentage of the electorate has voted already, and how those people voted. And then based on that, and those are hard numbers, or at least very good estimates, based on those numbers, the campaign is then able to identify how many more voters it needs to win a given state. Uh, it can then take those resources that for several weeks prior were targeted towards getting people to the polls early, and those resources are now available and free to bring new voters to the polls on election day. Uh, and in particular, a campaign that's, that's done its homework knows where their voters are. So they know, they know where those voters are, and they know that they have to target those people, get them to the polls. So by, by banking votes early, the campaign is then able to uh, do an updated assessment of what they need to win. Uh, if they know where those voters are, they have the resources to bring those voters to the polls so they can mobilize on Election Day. Um, in fact, in 2008, which was a completely different scenario, ultimately Obama won that very comfortably, um, there were states like Colorado where so many people voted early, uh, and the partisan breakdown was such that uh, both uh, McCain and Obama knew that uh, Obama had won that state prior to Election Day. It was already over in Colorado because of the early voting. So it, it d does matter to the campaigns. Barbara? Well, I have friends in Virginia too, and, and but the friends I were talking to were not perhaps as politically engaged as yours, but and they're in the sort of Hampton Roads area, and they were not impressed with the Obama campaign so far, although they are voting for Obama. The other thing is I was in Virginia, well I was in Washington last weekend, but I was watching Virginia television stations, and I have to say I was, uh, I was impressed with what I thought was the efficacy of the Romney uh, television advertising, its, uh, its focus on the economy. And I, this is just my intuition that the, the Obama, I'm sorry, the Romney television uh, advertising is, is, is working for Romney in that state. The polling shows uh, recently uh, Romney having pulled ahead, but I mean, I, it's very close. It seems to me that Virginia uh, could go either way. What do you want to say to that, Matt? Oh, uh, yeah, I think I think that um, I think that what you're talking about, David, speaks in part to the two different strategies. I think that uh, in state after state, the Obama ground operation, the field operation, is far superior to uh, the Romney operation, both in terms of the number of offices that are open, uh, in terms of the training uh, that the volunteers uh, have had, and in terms of uh, just the fact that it's been 
in existence for five years now. Uh, they basically never closed down after 2008. I think that uh, the Romney campaign is uh, focusing more on an air campaign, uh, on uh, not only their own advertisements, but on advertisements run by uh, affiliated groups uh, that uh, are operating uh, not in conjunction with, but on behalf of the campaign. So I think it does speak to that difference. And so the, the question then is, in the end, does a strong field operation ultimately overwhelm a good ad campaign? And I think that's one of the unanswered questions of this election in a number of states that are close. And I think Virginia is certainly uh, probably the most pivotal state, uh, but uh, to a certain extent Florida as well. I think in those states, uh, you know, if, if Obama is able to win, uh, it's likely in large part because of his ground operation. And Matt, here are the polls for Virginia that I, that I brought up. Oops. Forgot I can't. <laughs> I'm tethered by this. Um, yeah, uh, 40, okay, so 48-48, uh, uh, Romney plus 3, Romney plus 1 plus one, uh, the Obama plus five is, a, is a early okay. October. Um, so, you know, if you, if you average those together, uh, it's a, it is literally a tie, 48-48. And, um, you know, uh, can, I, can I actually, can I just say one more thing? Going back to what we were saying earlier about registered versus likely voters. Uh, and again, this is the other thing that I, 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 one of the unanswered questions that I think we should probably uh, keep our eyes on. Uh, is whether or not the uh, Obama campaign is able to bring out enough of its vote so that the registered voter number is closer to the ultimate electorate that we see on, uh, on election day. Uh, it, it, in, in registered voter polls, Obama is ahead comfortably, uh, not by a lot, but by enough to win, uh, three, four, five points. Uh, and in individual polls, we'll sometimes see disparities of three or four, five points between the registered voter number and the likely voter number. So we have to remember these are estimates. When we get numbers like this that are either literally tied or virtually tied, uh, it then comes down to things like mobilization. And we just don't know yet whether or not Obama is going to be able to mobilize enough voters to be able to win in an environment like this. Professor, you stressed the importance of Ohio quite a bit. And Professor Grant, you touched on this more toward the end, but I was just wondering if either of you or both of you could speak toward what influence Florida might have. I know the president's there campaigning today, and you know you said you'd be, they'd be spending a lot of time in Ohio, but can Florida have as much or less or more significance? Uh, David, can we put the map back up? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Um, okay, let's do it this way. Here's the Romney strategy. Romney has one path to 270 electoral votes. In 2008, Obama carried Indiana, he carried North Carolina, he carried Virginia. All three are traditionally red states. Although, again, going back to the demographics, Virginia is trending purple, and it's, it's got a pretty healthy dollop of blue in it, uh, largely from northern Virginia. North Carolina is purple on the national level. Indiana is really a red state. Indiana was, was uh, one time only. So the Romney strategy was win these states with strong natural Republican leans. He'll win Indiana. He is leading in, in North Carolina, again, not by a lot, but fairly consistently. And he should win North Carolina unless the Obama ground game is so good and he brings so many unlikely voters to the polls that there's a surprise. I don't expect that. So Indiana, North Carolina, Virginia. Virginia is the toughest of the three because of Northern Virginia, because Northern Virginia demographically is New Jersey uh, as far as national politics uh, goes. So he has to win those three states. He then needs to win both Florida and Ohio and he needs to take a significant Obama state away from him. That's the only path for Romney. If you look at this map that David put up earlier, uh, this map has him doing it. Uh, actually, it's not because of New Hampshire, but it's because of Colorado. It's the nine electoral votes in Colorado, along with Indiana, North Carolina, Virginia, Florida, and Ohio, that give Romney the presidency. If he's able to pull that off, he doesn't need New, uh, New Hampshire, uh, and he wins. How important is Florida? 
For Romney, it's essential. There is no path to the presidency for Mitt Romney without Florida. For Obama, it's not essential, uh, except obviously since it's essential for Obama, if Obama wins it, it's over. Mm -hmm. And it really is a tie. Again, it is a tie. Maybe, maybe the numbers show Romney plus one, but it is a statistical tie. It's also a very expensive state, and it's a difficult state uh, for mobilization. The Obama campaign has invested heavily in it. Uh, they have registered a lot of uh, new Democrats. They're counting on getting those voters to the polls, uh, and they're engaged heavily in the early voting efforts to try to do that. So Florida is essential in the sense that Romney can't win without it, uh, but you have to assume he has Florida. You have to assume he has Florida in order, to, uh, in order for the election to turn on Ohio. I agree with that. And I, you know, why do we keep saying about, you know, Romney has to do these things, he has to do these things in order to win? It's because, uh, partly it's because Obama comes into this thing with really a structural advantage, which is another way of saying, we know that Obama is getting California. By the way, he's getting the northwestern states as well. We know that Obama is getting New York. It's very likely he's getting Pennsylvania. We know he's getting Illinois. They're just, and I think Michigan is extremely likely for Obama. So the fact is when you add up the states that are either certain or very likely to be uh, for Obama, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a struggle for Romney. Uh, Romney could win the national popular vote and still lose the Electoral College. It, it could happen. Yes. Um, what is your opinion as to why Romney isn't going to be getting his home state in Massachusetts? It seems to be going blue, like definitely. The question is why is Romney not going to win uh, his home state of Massachusetts? Well, Massachusetts uh, uh, traditionally is a liberal democratic voting state. He had to conform to that and he became a kind of a moderate liberal uh, back in the days of, of running for and then being for a time uh, being the governor of Massachusetts and you know he was okay with Roe versus Wade and he was okay with certain uh, reforms for gays and lesbians and you know he, he was a kind of a moderate liberal. I and I'm interested in Matt's opinion, but but I think that when Massachusetts voters looked at you know the the, the newer version of Romney, which is the I'm sort of lumping together his three versions, but these these sort of recent versions of Romney, which is a Romney who, in order to get the nomination, had to make peace with the conservative wing of the party, and that's not a Romney that that most voters in Massachusetts want to vote for. Did you want to speak to that? Sure. Um, I think David's absolutely right. Uh, I, I would only add that when Romney was governor of Massachusetts, he served one term, he didn't run for re-election, and there's a reason. Uh, he would have lost very badly. Uh, he's very unpopular in Massachusetts. He spent the second half of his governorship uh, beginning to run for president. He was out of state a lot. Uh, and there's a great deal of antagonism between Romney and the voters of Massachusetts. Uh, I, think, I think an interesting and related issue is that uh, uh, Paul Ryan is from Wisconsin, and Wisconsin continues to lean ever so slightly, but fairly consistently towards Obama. So it's conceivable that on election day, uh, Romney Ryan will lose both home states. Uh, they could still win the presidency, uh, the vice presidency, but it's, it's very likely uh, that they won't win Wisconsin, and it's certain that they won't win Massachusetts. Uh, last I checked, the board is pretty close in Wisconsin. Uh, isn't there a situation where Romney wins Wisconsin? They don't. They won't need Ohio in that situation, right? You can, Wisconsin is, is kind of like four voters. Uh, well, you can you can start to get into scenarios where Obama. Uh, where one of them wins Ohio and the other one wins Wisconsin, or if Romney loses Ohio, he can make up 10 of those electoral votes in Wisconsin, but then you're getting into, let's do the map here. Can we, oh, we have there's Wisconsin the numbers, okay. Yeah. So um, here's the map. Oh, there's the map, okay, great. So, uh, so I, I mean, Wisconsin is, is an important state, it's a swing state, uh, and, and certainly it factors into the electoral math, but if you start to rank the swing states in terms of uh, how, how certain they seem to be to be leaning one way or the other, uh, Wisconsin is further down on the list, uh, as is Nevada, uh, as is Iowa. Those states seem to lean consistently towards Obama, um, whereas North Carolina, 
uh, leans consistently towards Romney, uh, and Florida and Virginia are ever so slightly leaning towards Romney, but are really, really toss-ups. So uh, you can you can look at Wisconsin, but strategically, uh, you know, if you're looking if you're looking at putting a winning coalition together, and you're Mitt Romney, uh, you have to go into Ohio. You have to assume Florida and work hard for it. But you have to go into Ohio uh, because once Ohio is out of the picture. Uh, even with Wisconsin, it's, remember, Ohio is 18 votes, Wisconsin is, is, is only 10. One last question. Is this the last uh, election for the Electoral College? Is this the <laughs> last election for the Electoral College? That's I'm, a 200-year-old question. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure the answer is no. You know, a lot of people on the left were very upset with the existence of the Electoral College after the 2000 election. Should Romney win the popular vote but lose the Electoral College, I think that would turn some people on the right end of the spectrum against the existence of the Electoral College. But to get rid of it takes a, uh, some version of a, well, a constitutional amendment. And uh, personally, I, I favor abolishing the Electoral College. I think the person who gets the most votes nationwide should become the president. But that's not the system, and I don't think it's going to change in the foreseeable future. Did you want to speak to that? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> well, I teach a class at 4 o'clock, so I think we're going to call this quits. Thank you all very much. Thank you.